Dear hearts and gentle people, this is the voice of Joseph B. Whiteman on um, January 23rd, 1979. You folks can all see what the island is like now. That is what's left of it. But I will try to explain what it looked like when I came here during World War I back in 1917. There was no automobiles and no tractors on the island when I got here. All the cultivation was done with uh, horses and mules. Maybe occasionally an ox team, but uh, that was uh, would be all look primitive to uh, you folks in this modern age. And in order to get to the island, I came on the fish boat, that is with my folks, from Ponta Gorda. The fish boat ran from Ponta Gorda, bringing ice down on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. It made the return trip to Ponta Gorda, taking fish the opposite direction on Tuesdays and alternately every other day through the uh, week. The other boat that uh, servicing the island and carried the mail came six days a week from Fort Myers, the Kinsey Brothers, and was commonly called the Dixie Line. He had one steamboat by that uh, name, Dixie. The, uh, when the uh, first tractor came to the um, island, it was about the equivalent of um, a five-horse David Bradley tractor would be uh, nowadays. And um, it was such an important event that the um, a school was taken down so that all of us children could see this wonderful machine put together that uh, would replace our uh, horses and mules. The uh, Andrew Kinsey lent us one of his engineers to uh, help with the assembly of this uh, tractor. And um, so it came shipped in boxes, so it had to be assembled right uh, on the spot. It was bought by a uh, fellow by Jose uh, Sanchez U. He lived where Mrs. Weeks lives now and uh, had this um, little five acre piece behind this place. I think he uh, owned the in, owned the seven acres at the time, but um, there was only about five acres that was under cultivation. And when we got the um, tractor put together, they uh, put homegrown uh, castor oil in the base. Now this wasn't because the uh, tractor needed a physic, but um, prior to World War One. The uh, best machine oil that uh, people could get at that time was made from, re or that rendered from, a castor beans, which was growing right here on these islands. And the patriotic people donated castor beans to the uh, military for the aviation at during World War I, because at that time, the uh, mineral oils had not been developed probably to the stage that they are nowadays. 
And uh, so they put this high-priced oil in their um, Liberty planes. The uh, castor oil was not desirable in two-cycle engines where you put mix the um, oil with the fuel because to inhale that it had a, a very sickening effect. Uh, the very first automobile to come to the island was a four-cylinder Cadillac owned by um, Ed Knowles. They took the uh, back part of it off and made a, a box that would uh, hold, um, I think the most they could get onto it would, was six crates of grapefruit and used it to buck uh, fruit in out of the um, uh, grapefruit groves. At that time, from uh, here, the center of Captiva North, there was um, a grapefruit grove owned by Knowles, one by uh, Bryant's, and another one by uh, Carter's, besides uh, a few on the Bates place, and then this uh, place that I just mentioned that belonged to uh, Sanchez. Over on Buck Key, there was four fairly nice grapefruit groves, uh, and since then, all of Buck Key it was went back to the uh, wild, and the greater part of um, Captiva has washed away. When I came back at the close of World War II, I met um, Tob Bryant in, his, in Fort Myers and uh, told him that his well was out 20 feet in the surf at that time. And he told me that when he uh, drilled the well there, it was in the center of his property that he intended to farm. He says, I did not count Protection Ridge, and which was on the outside of the um, property that he intended to farm. Now, this uh, term Protection Ridge, that ridge is completely gone now, but it laid in a straight line from um, somewhere here on Captiva all the way to um, Captiva Pass. See, that um, Redfish Pass did not break through until 1921. When the fruit was picked on Captiva and they were ready to move the um, uh, car to uh, Buck Key, they put planks across two Pontegorda fish skiffs and uh, drove it on and ferried it across from one island to the other. Occasionally somebody asked me why they made that curve in uh, uh, Roosevelt Channel to go across to where it goes across to Buck Key and then comes back again. The, uh, the answer to that is that's where Armsby had their uh, dock where they loaded the grapefruit directly there onto the deeper draft steamboats. Before the Roosevelt Channel was dug, the um, fruit was taken out in small boats to what they called the bulkhead, which was just to the uh, north of uh, where the, the uh, channel opens into the bay uh, now. And uh, occasionally somebody would ask me, well, where did um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt stay? Well, I'd have to point out to where the fish houses used to be. See, there was no hotel uh, yet at that time. The uh, first hotel that was built here on Captiva was built by uh, Lane. It was a three-story building that um, burned down 
I think, uh, well, it, it was called Captiva Lodge at the time it was burned down. When Mr. Lane built the um, Bayview Hotel, he uh, purchased from Fort Myers uh, Edison Number no. 2, which um, was about a 3KW direct current generator. When uh, Fort Myers outgrew it and had to go to uh, bigger and better things. I'm uh, sorry that it isn't here today. It was sold during uh, World War II as uh, scrap metal because it was really a museum piece. It was uh, hand wound spools at way larger than uh, any uh, generator that would develop that much in modern time, and it was pulled by a um, single cylinder donkey engine, which was um, about a seven horsepower um, engine, w would take two men to crank when I first came to the island. One person had to hold the valves open while another person get the big heavy flywheel to spinning real fast and then when he'd quit spinning they'd turn the uh, valves loose so as it would go over on compression. It did not have um, a closed crankcase but um, the oil would only go through once uh, through what they call drip oil cups. On each main bearing there would be a um, this little glass bowl that had a needle valve go down through the center and uh, it had it be adjusted so as there would be um, about two drops of oil go into the main bearing each um, minute and the uh, connecting rod bearing uh, picked up uh, its oil from still a, uh, another drip um, cup from where it would wipe as it goes around it would uh, wipe from uh, where the contact was to, in order to pick up its oil. So that would really be a uh, museum piece if it was still around today. The, um, some of those old engines w would run on a uh, fuel that they called distillate. Distillate was uh, something near like uh, our modern stove oil. But uh, that way they could run it on cheaper uh, fuel because the distillate they could buy for about eight cents a gallon in those days. And that way it was um, a considerable saving than that high priced gasoline that was about 15 cents a gallon. The Edison II um, was um, belt driven and uh, the... Uh, there was two wheels on the um, shaft of the dynamo. One of them was fastened solid so the belt when it was crowded over onto it and the other one would be an idle wheel. See that was a forerunner of your modern day clutch. You'd take a uh, board or uh, some piece of wood uh, when you to chase the belt from uh, the uh, power wheel to the uh, idle wheel when you was ready to shut down so uh, anything unload and um, that dynamo was a hundred and ten volts and um, he had two rows of um, two bolt cells which was fifty five cells in each row and the rows were um, then were connected together so that would be a, um, a multiple series connection. We had one um, school mom that was uh, proud to be called Captain Fadley. 
you see, she had um, a skipper's license besides her school teacher's certificate. On Sanibel Island, starting at um, Dinkins Bio, of course, Dinkins had um, a uh, large grow. There was um, groves between grapefruit and um, oranges all the way from there, clear along um, where is Periwinkle Way now, all the way down to um, where the uh, road crossed the um, island to go to where uh, Bailey's store was. And uh, where it was, was an outgrowth of uh, Sanibel Packing Company. There was another uh, a packing house at um, a Tarpon Bay, and there was a um, fruit back in place at uh, Wolpert. And of course, the uh, one packing shed that was here on uh, Captiva was up at um, uh, Carter's. Between uh, where the uh, road is now on Sanibel and uh, the uh, beach was uh, most all uh, truck farmed. That meant uh, tomatoes and peppers, uh, small uh, crops. And uh, in 1918, uh, Sanibel Island was considered one of the uh, best uh, truck farming districts in the uh, United States. In, uh, but the uh, disadvantage is in order to raise vegetables here, you have to fertilize. And the farmers that farm Sanibel used to farm lengthways of the ridges. That way, uh, in wet years, they had the crop on top the ridges. And in dry years, uh, toward the um, valley. If you walk out across a part of Sanibel, uh, even today, you can still find those old uh, tomato rows, little ridges. Uh, but of course, the um, island has all grown up since that time. In 1918, Gulf Drive was put completely around both islands of uh, Sanibel and uh, Captiva, and uh, back uh, where it was uh, considered safe at that time from the uh, Gulf. But now, the old, all of it that is left of the original um, Gulf Drive is this little short piece from Captiva Post Office south to the uh, S-curve. Many of the roads that we are using now did not follow a survey. It was the other way around. People drove uh, whichever way they could to get through easily. And uh, later on, the maintenance man uh, maintained where people were driving. And then uh, eventually, the, um, before they got around to blacktopping, the surveyors followed the uh, a road and um, accepted it where they were going to uh, blacktop. The oldest homesteader that was living here when I came was William Binder. William Binder was a very uh, interesting character, but he had lost one eye. He had lost his eye by uh, loading a gun too heavy to where it uh, backfired through the breach and blew the bolt into his eye. Uh, he was the only person on the island at the time uh, his accident uh, occurred. And in order to remove the uh, bolt from his eye, uh, he uh, put the bolt into the door jam and then uh, clo uh, closed the door onto it because he didn't have a uh, pair of pliers and then reared backwards. And when uh, he did that, why well, his um, eye came out and stuck to the bolt instead of pulling the bolt out of his eye. So all you uh, young folks, let that be a lesson to you. If you have a gun that was uh, made to fire um, black powder, don't load it with gun cotton or a fast burning 
powder. You uh, use the uh, each piece of equipment the way it was for what it, it was designed. William Binder had been the sole survivor of a shipwreck. The ship had uh, crowded the uh, what we now call Foster's Point a little too close, trying to make um, Boca Grande Harbor in a uh, hurricane. The there was a strong wind from the east, and the rest of the crew were in a boat or a lifeboat arrangement that they couldn't row against that strong a wind, so they was blowing out in the gulf. And he never did see them again. Any of them ever made it back to uh, uh, where he came from in Europe. I think it was some uh, later become a suburb of Germany. The carter that had homesteaded here had first come down with the militia at the time uh, United States bought Florida from Spain. And he, uh, with a, the group, and they carried a proclamation in six languages to read to whoever they could find. And uh, some of them they literally had to catch because um, they um, were uh, various languages. They had nothing in common with each other. And each person they gave the choice of... Um, they could become a citizen of the United States and um, homestead and prove up on the uh, whatever property they were living on, or they were granted safe passage back to whatever country they came from. Uh, some of them did it one way and some of them did it the other. When the road was being graded past our uh, house, they were um, being done with convict labor, uh, which was common, I guess, here in Florida. And uh, when it was announced that they were going to use the convict labor on their islands to, uh, to gr build the, uh, that road, it, we children were told to run disregard the convicts as if they weren't even there. And uh, one of the uh, mules broke loose from their tormentor and came um, running up to the house and uh, with its front hoof tapped on a wash tub and knickered. So my mother went out and gave it a, um, uh, drew a couple buckets of uh, water for it to drink and then took the uh, halter rope and handed it to uh, uh, the guard who came up to uh, reclaim the uh, mule. So uh, after that happened, I had asked my mother, I said, well, I thought we weren't supposed to have anything to do with those people. And um, she, what she told me then, I remembered the rest of my life. She says, it isn't the mule that was the criminal but rather the person that um, allowed the mule to be so badly uh, mistreated. So that one, I've always remembered, the animals are not the criminals. For a good many years, the, uh, a very interesting character that um, came to the island about uh, once a uh, month was Reverend Gatewood. He was a circuit preacher. He would uh, preach uh, here on Captiva one week and on um, to uh, Sanibel the next week and maybe uh, St. James the uh, next uh, week. So uh, he'd uh, make, make his rounds. Uh, he uh, wrote a story about these islands uh, called uh, titled the Coconut Islands. It um, he breaks off his history about the time I would be starting uh, mine. So it would be a very interesting uh, thing if, if you can read that book or a book, uh, I any of the writings probably by Reverend Gatewood. He was also a census taker and uh, 
he was um, a reporter for some uh, newspaper in Ponte Gorda. There was a retired Episcopalian uh, preacher that lived on Sanibel uh, near Wolford. Uh, he uh, name was we called him Father Stolle. He liked to take care of um, weddings, but uh, most people, if they had to go to Fort Myers to get the um, uh, license, marriage license, anyhow, they just went right ahead and got married while they was over in Fort Myers. We used to figure it a three-day trip to Fort Myers and back because uh, whoever went to Fort Myers would um, take up a um, list of small favors that he could do for his neighbors and it'd take him from noon till six o'clock to get in uh, to um, uh, dock at Fort Myers. Then he'd usually uh, rent a room in a hotel for two nights because uh, everything would be closed up when you get there so you do all your shopping the uh, following day and um, see the dentist of course and um, usually get a uh, store-bought haircut and then um, you have to uh, get up early enough to catch the boat starting at about six o'clock in the morning in order to get back to the island by uh, noon that's on the uh, the third day you see so uh, then by the time you um, uh, pass out whatever you picked up for your neighbors, well, that uh, you'd be used up three days in going to town and back. A man by the name of A.M. Gore was our village blacksmith. Now, people from up north will sometimes say, well, why did the uh, uh, people uh, need to shoe their uh, horses and here in Florida? Well, the answer to that is sand crack a hoof that is allowed to grow without being kept trim will get out just so long and then it will crack and the sand will start building up in the crack until it goes clear up into the quick and make a, uh, a horse or mule so uh, lame that they can't even uh, walk. So it, they have to be taken care of here probably... Um, more often than they do where they're walking on something hard and wearing their uh, hoops off straight. During World War I, there become a uh, shortage of leather and uh, there was lots of sharks in the waters here. So they established a what they call the Ocean Leather Company, which was located on Sanibel, about where Bill Way's Marina is now. They um, fished the sharks out so thoroughly that it took them a good many years before we saw very many uh, large sharks again. There was once a hemp factory at uh, St. James City, uh, but it, I think, went uh, broke because they could um, uh, buy rope from uh, Philippines where... Um, there was cheaper labor than what anybody would work um, hemp for here in the United States. We still have three varieties of hemp growing on the island that would make good uh, rope. There was two varieties of cane growing on the island that uh, they make uh, syrup from. One was called Blue Ribbon and the other one we just referred to as the white tussle variety. In order to get the uh, sap out of the uh, cane, they had the uh, cane squeezer that was built, looked like uh, two rollers. One of them turned from a power sweep with a uh, boom on proceeding from the top of it, and the uh, mule would walk in a circle all day while the people uh, fed the uh, cane between the two rollers and from the uh, there the juice went down and was caught into a trough. When the, when the juice was boiled down it would foam up um, and the foam was skimmed off and uh, 
put into a barrel by itself because the uh, that which boiled down would be make the syrup, but the impurities would boil up and be skimmed off, and uh, usually that was used to make rot gut whiskey. Some of the Model T Ford uh, radiators prior to 1920 was made from copper, and the, uh, the top hose could be put onto a two-inch nipple, and the two-inch uh, nipple screwed into a street L, and the street L's fit a two-inch street L fit the uh, large uh, hole in the top of a uh, an oil drum. The oil drums would be cleaned out real good before they filled it partly up with uh, cane skimmings. And then they would uh, mix a certain amount of, um, of cornmeal or grits into the um, cane skimmings and use a yeast cake for a starter. And when it was fermented uh, just right, they could uh, draw, the, build a fire under the barrel and uh, separate the um, rat gut off through the uh, a copper radiator. Whoever was performing that operation had to be careful and not build the fire too high. It would almost work with just the sun shining on the barrel because if they scorched the uh, uh, whiskey, then it'd be a, a really rotten rot gut. There was good whiskey uh, on the islands, but that was for the rich people because that had to be bootlegged through from Cuba. So ain't it good just to be alive? The rottenest rot gut uh, batch that I've ever known to be uh, run off on the islands was done by uh, Edwin Rhodes. It was, um, the still was set up between Doc Turner's homestead uh, house and the bay. And uh, it made the entire family so sick that when they uh, did sober up, uh, his father took the uh, coil, which was a half inch um, galvanized pipe that was screwed into the small hole of the barrel instead of the large because he couldn't find at that time a uh, copper um, radiator. And the, uh, his father took this out and he said he hid it where nobody would ever find that one again. Well, he was almost right because 28 years later when I was wiring the house for uh, Farina Ralston, I uh, went to the bay, was where there was mullet coming up, and threw my cast net and tangled into that old coil. I recognized it on sight, but he was almost right, and he was trying to take care of his heathenish children. That old syrup mill set almost where um, Maud Myers' house is. And of course, the farmland uh, extended about almost a half mile yet west of there. Don't look for it now, it's gone. Somebody had asked me where did the airplanes used to land on Captiva Island? Well, we'll take the, something like the Mucky Duck and uh, go about 50 yards straight west from their front porch would put you about the north end of the landing strip. And the uh, south end would be uh, just uh, a little bit north of Dickey's Pier. Well, since then, the pier is gone, the beach is gone, the landing strip is gone, Next, the main part of the roadway is gone. The next thing in line to go will probably be Captiva Cemetery. Uh, blessed are the dead, they will not feel anything. Uh, several years later, the uh, Crescent Farms opened up a uh, shorter tr strip in uh, where the lime grove used to be. We used that for a uh, few years. Now uh, we don't have 
any at all. See, we Islanders are getting poor. We don't have a lot of the things we once had. The only airstrip left open on the islands uh, now is um, Kazawibel, and uh, the approach is very poor from the west because the um, thermals uh, over the uh, condominiums that has been built since then. And of course, the North Island has got one of the streets um, open in Jose Hideaway that the uh, planes can uh, land on. It's an east and west approach. The last school teacher that taught public school on Captiva Island was Robert Knowles. He uh, now is retired and lives on First Street on Sanibel Island. Drop in and see him sometime. Uh, tell him what a stupid uh, student he had by the name of Joe Whiteman. And the private school that was operating uh, here, the last couple years that they uh, operated, they had a school teacher. His name was Ken Curtis. So don't confuse the um, act that you see on television with the true character. There is no comparison. In rural areas ahead of electricity, there was, the, of course, the Colmer lantern, which was burn white gasoline, where you pumped them up with air to keep the gasoline under pressure, and had to have mantles. I see some of them still advertised in the uh, catalog today. The other alternative was carbide lights. Carbide was um, something that was like uh, cooked to an extent where um, it would be unquickened lime and charcoal. So as when it would touch the water, it, it would quicken and release the um, carbon uh, gas. This um, way, if a uh, house was fixed for gas, they would have the small tubes run from a uh, place where they could have a barrel of water on the outside of the house. Then they could put a keg of carbide on the inside of a uh, another uh, barrel that would be a floating upside down with the gas connection hose at, in the bottom of the barrel, which would, of course, be the top. And once you turn the barrel over, over your keg of um, carbide, which would be fastened in this. So when the uh, carbide touched the water, it would lift the inside barrel and hold a, a constant pressure of whatever you, weight that you had a, against it, and that way you give uh, you people could burn what carbide gas. S uh, some of the fishermen that, that would work at night would uh, use a uh, a carbide light, the same as uh, what was used by miners at that time. Or they could wear on their cap. And you put a little bit of carbide into it, and uh, has water drip to uh, like a ne through a, a needle valve to control the uh, speed that the light would burn. Uh, a little bit later, back in about uh, 1925, uh, uh, the um, fire fishing was outlawed in Florida. And uh, along with it, they um, uh, practically went the carbide uh, lights because they was classed as fire fishing, something that would have a flame on to them. But the uh, fishermen of today, of course, can still uh, clear the nets under a um, floodlight, which um, operates from their storage battery that they use on their boat. Before fire fishing uh, was outlawed, a person could take either a Coleman lantern or one of those carbide lights on an outgoing tide with a dip net and pick up um, a mess of shrimp. 
you could sort the shrimp and use the small ones for bait and the large ones to uh, eat. They, um, this being a capitalistic country, naturally they had to uh, uh, fix it so we poor people couldn't um, get our own um, shrimp. They had to have uh, it so we have to go through a wholesale house and let the... Um, oh well, at least once upon a time it was a free country. Two of my neighbors used to uh, raise and prepare their own tobacco. William Binder uh, made his into what he called Long Green Twist. Uh, Charlie Burst uh, had a uh, tobacco press where um, he'd lay the um, dry leaves in in a certain way and uh, flavor his um, tobaccos with a little bit of honey and uh, licorice and into a uh, tobacco press. And then it was pressed down real um, tight and um, run through a curing stage somehow and that, that may, way he made it into chewing tobacco. Charlie Burst had been a captain in the Confederate Army. When he uh, retired he sold his uh, property to C.B. Chadwick and moved to Ponte Gorda, him and his uh, wife. He had one son that uh, was in the army in World War I. He was uh, a great checker player. And he taught me how to uh, tie some of the uh, knots that I still use in, uh, when I make my cast nets yet today. So uh, I see that we're getting near the end of this uh, tape. So um, the... Uh, I will ha may have to draw this uh, to a close very quickly. I try to take you from the ox cart to the uh, automobile in the first tape. Maybe we'll get from the automobile up to an airplane in the other side. Uh, the uh, man that um, washed away with the uh, blind pass uh, fish house, his name was Mr. Rhodes. His father I had met in Fort Myers when he was running what they called a star route delivery from there east to the eastern edge of the county. So I might sound like the ancient Merlin uh, here if I start telling about people across six generations and after all I'm a young man yet. I, my grandfather lived to be 93 doing what come naturally. On this tape I have given just briefs of um, information. Outside of this a person could probably write uh, 50 stories but uh, I should not get too far involved in things like that or some of you will think I'm a bigger liar than Robert Ripley. Uh, he came through Pine Island Sound here once in a uh, Chinese junk gathering information. The thing that he gathered uh, out of the, wanted out of this uh, location was the uh, story about uh, oysters growing on trees. Uh, that we have plenty of in the, some of the uh, adjoining bios where the red mangroves limbs go down into the water and the oysters stick to them. When he had eaten some of our local oysters, he claimed they were the best flavored oysters he had ever eaten, and he had eaten oysters all the way around the world. I hope that the uh, information that I am giving will be informative and educational. But whatever happens now and in the future, we can never go back. The, uh, back in the time when they was plowing ground with the oxen, it took a yoke of oxen uh, between 10 and a 12 hour day to plow one acre of land. That would seem foolish for anybody to go out and try to even uh, fool around with something like that nowadays.
because some of our big tractors can get out on a section of the level ground and uh, plow as much as between 50 and 60 acres of land. Therefore, the small farmer, once he was crowded out, can never go back and become a competitive again. These islands were settled by farmers and fishermen. The last farmer, I believe, to give up on Sanibel Island was John Stewart. Just ahead of him might have been Brewer. But the, uh, a few of the descendants of the fishermen are still around, but they usually always carry a guide license to, uh, as a backup if they can't make it on fishing.